All right. This brings us to the last presentation before the uh, deep learning panel. So I'll, I'll just give a brief overview over um, H2O's deep learning, where it is right now and where we're going in the next few months. So um, for those of you who have used H2O, you'll notice that um, H2O deep learning feels just like H2O GBM or H2O random forest or H2O GLM, right? They're all supervised models. Deep learning has some unsupervised parts too, but basically it's a model. It runs uh, from R, Python, Flow, Scala, Java, whatever. It runs on a cluster, runs on distributed data sets that cannot fit on a single machine. Um, it can have categorical values in it. It can have missing values in it. You don't have to standardize anything. It'll just run. You don't have to worry about learning rates or momentum. Um, you just say go and it runs. And that's what I showed yesterday in the demo. And this is just like a, a quick illustration for a, for a spiral data set. So you have two intertwined spirals. One is black, one is red. You have some noisy data that like, represents, that comes from this distribution, let's say. And now the goal is to fit that. And the deep learning model makes a nice round contour. The gradient boosting and random forest, they cut up the space into these square uh, locally straight lines, let's say. But if you have enough trees, then you can make it round as well. And the GLM has no chance because it just makes a straight line and it cannot really separate the two spirals. So that's kind of the intuition behind these models. So you get the idea that deep learning has some power, right? It learns some nonlinear interactions between X and Y in this case. It can memorize a spiral, basically. And in H2O, it comes natural. So for all these CSV, um, data sets where you have columns that have meaning, like age, income, zip code, uh, whatever, uh, last uh, count of websites you visited in the last five minutes, in the last month, and so on. These regular type features. Uh, our H2O deep learning is really well suited for that. Now, if you go to images, then it gets more difficult. If it's MNIST, it's fine. MNIST, what KK showed earlier, the standardized data set where the digits are all like centered and rotated nicely and uh, grayscale, uh, standardized, then it's okay. Once you have random photos of, of uh, just like pixel values, then it becomes difficult because each individual pixel hasn't ha doesn't have a meaning, right? It's not just um, it means something. Yes, it's the it's the it's the color at that point of the image, but that's not meaningful enough for the model to learn what that means. For that, you need convolutional neural nets that that do the same physics that as our eyes. It does some some Fourier transforms figure out that there's sharp corners or colors and transitions between colors and so on. And then you can build a model. So that's what real deep learning stands for. That's outside of our domain right now. So we need to add this convolutional neural net. But for regular data sets like the airline data set, you can build a GLM model in 10 seconds on 100 million rows on a 10 node cluster. Um, or you can build a deep learning model in also just less than a minute on the whole data set with 100 million rows. So it's super fast, it's nice, you get a boost in accuracy from 65 to 70. So I just want to tell you that if you have a normal data set without image, without speech, just numbers, let's say, or strings, you get some value out of deep learning. You can compare that against GBM and see which one wins. So now that brings me to the, the landscape of deep learning tools. You see MXNet. Um, TensorFlow, uh, H2O, and um, Tiano somewhere. Um, where is it? Here, Keras, Tiano. So these are all big, big uh, ecosystems. And TensorFlow and Deep Learning were uh, H2O's Deep Learning were tied in this KD Nuggets poll. I mentioned that yesterday, just to remind you, we're kind of up there, but the combination of the two will be even more powerful, right? So. And there's a quick demo that shows TensorFlow inside of H2O, but that integration isn't really that tight. All we're doing is we, we're taking data, we distribute it across the cluster, and on each node we call TensorFlow to run some model. And um, you have to basically write some Python scripts and so on. You can look up the GitHub uh, example, just Google H2O TensorFlow Deep Learning. Um, you'll see that script. But it's, it's in the end asking TensorFlow to build a fully connected neural net, just like we do. And then we get the numbers back, stuff it into our H2O model, and say, this is how you should start. And then we can continue training in H2O, or we can make a POJO to put it, that model in deployment. So it's a nice way to get a POJO out of a TensorFlow model if you want. But we still don't have the ability right now to, say, do an image recognition problem or a speech problem. So this is just a first step, basically. You can call something else. So the goal to have uh, all of this 
is clear. We, are, we want GPU backends, we want TensorFlow, we want MXNet, we want Cafe. We want to call these tools and do recurrent neural nets here for sequences, not just like each pixel value is, is right now like this, but you have a stream of, of information coming in and based on the interdependence of those values, you can, you can predict that this sequence is uh, fraud or no fraud, for example. And that's much more valuable than to just uh, do a regular model. So recurrent neural nets have been valuable for text problems, NLP, uh, convolutional neural nets have been very valuable for image recognition problems. When you put them together, you can do uh, real-time translation of, of images to texts, right? You can say, this room is full of people that are looking at me right now. The, the robot could do that, right? And say, okay, I know what's going on. So all this, this kind of awareness of the world is more than just CSV files. So it definitely makes sense to have image recognition and, and speech and scene parsing and understanding of the structure of the, the landscape, um, image captioning and so on. So you need recurrent and convolutional neural nets, no question. And, and these tools have that. So once we put these tools into H2O, then we'll have more than just this. This is what we have right now. This is the H2O execution engine. It's Java. Uh, you can talk to it from R, Python, or Flow. You can talk to it um, from Scala, from the driver node on your laptop, or you can actually um, connect it inside of a Spark cluster. Each node has a JVM inside of the Spark JVM, and you can, you can, you can run stuff from the Java universe, let's say. And that's usually what we program. We write the Java code, or, or Spark contributors write the MLlib code, as you saw earlier, and you can run MLlib algorithms from Flow or inside the H2O ecosystem. Now, H2O talks to each other on the different nodes via our own RPC protocol. So we have to write uh, the serialization of messages. We have to write uh, remote execution of code. We have to write multi-threading, uh, fork join, and all that, all in Java. And always the CPU is used to execute the actual instructions, right? Now, the future will look a little more complicated. So we'll still have all that Java logic. We'll still have the communication channels between the HDO nodes. We can store models. When you connect to the cluster and say, hey, how does the model look like? We can still pull it out via the web server that is uh, driven by the REST API. Um, so it's all the same. However, the Java execution engine can ask TensorFlow or MXNet or Cafe or other tools to run some C++ code via the Java native interface. And then Java will send data to C++. So we'll take the, the images that come in from your Hadoop cluster, let's say, or your, your log files or your CSV files, whatever it is, from the H2O memory store will dump it into the C++ code and say, please run this. So we might have to write some C++ wrapper, and, and KK has done that already in the demo I showed yesterday. We, we can take like an image and say, what is it? And then you call the inception model from Google that does the ImageNet 1,000 class classification. It tells you this is a dog and this particular kind of dog. And that string that prints, I'm a dog, you can now see this. But somehow we have to deal with how the information goes back up, right? But how does C++ even get the, the actual prediction? Well, it asks the GPU or the CPU. And that's also transparent to the user. As long as the libraries are configured properly in your environment, which we will take care of, it will just run. So ideally, you give us a machine with either GPU or not, and we'll just run the, the logic either fast or not, basically. But you don't have to worry about, um, you, you'll get uh, either Docker images or AMIs or, or instructions how to compile it yourself. But we'll take care of all this bundling for you. And the, the dream would be, and actually we can already do this in, a, in our environments right now, is for you to say, hey, I want to um, connect to H2O. I want to run um, an image classification problem. For example, this, this Kaggle challenge here, the state farm distracted drivers that KK showed earlier. And I want to start with, uh, let's say, this network here, ResNet, Microsoft last year's winning model um, for image classification. So let's take that. But unfortunately, that was trained on 1,000 classes. Now I want to train it for my 10 classes, because there's only 10 different types of distracted drivers for this problem. And in your particular problem, it could be, is this, um, I don't know, is this fraud or not? If this person is running around with a, a baseball bat and is their hands into the supermarket or something, or is this going to be a problem or not? Whatever you want to classify, you can um, train your new problem, right, on, on, 
on top of an existing problem. The beauty of deep learning is it's just a brain that learns. So once you add new information, new images, it keeps learning. You don't have to always predict the same thousand classes. You can just reuse the first hundred layers that learned how to do the eye physics, if you want, and then just turn that into something that can now predict whether it's this base bat, baseball swinging bat person or not, right? And you don't worry about whether it's a dog or cat or mouse, because in order to see whether it's a dog or cat or mouse, you also have to see what's in the image. And the same thing is true for somebody holding a baseball bat. You also have to know the shapes and the colors and the contrast and so on. So it's the same kind of model. So once you have a good model, your own or something else, you can just take this as a starting point, fine-tune it on your Hadoop cluster, Spark cluster, on your millions of new images with labels, or no labels. If you have other problems, you can do unsupervised training as well. But the goal is for you to be just taking these building blocks and saying, run, and it'll just work. And the same will be true for time series, for NLP text problems. So this is the dream, and we'll realize it this summer. So thank you very much.